Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Laurel Page, and I'm the Assistant Director of Events at the University of Colorado Boulder's Leeds School of Business. Welcome to our seventh COVID-19 webinar series. These continue to be trying times, and here at CU Boulder, we have gathered our world-renowned faculty and alumni to provide frank and timely insights for life during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today is the fourth of six webinars in this COVID-19 related webinar series. To view upcoming webinars, please visit colorado.edu backslash business backslash alumni, click the drop down arrow and click attend online webinars. For today's webinar, we're excited to welcome Dr. Matthew McQueen here presenting the epidemiology of COVID-19 one year later. A few housekeeping items before we begin, First, if you have any questions now or during the presentation that you would like to ask Matthew, please send a question through the Q&A interface. We will monitor questions as they are submitted and Matthew will respond to them at the end of the presentation. As a reminder for optimum audio quality, we do have everyone on mute except for myself and our speaker. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please notify us through the chat interface and one of our support specialists will touch base. Lastly, a link to access the webinar recording will be sent to all registrants tomorrow along with a survey link and supplemental resources from today's presentation. Now I am excited to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Matthew McQueen is an epidemiologist and professor of integrative physiology and director for the public health certificate program on the CU Boulder campus. Dr. McQueen is engaged in a highly interdisciplinary research program and is the director of epidemiology for the CU Boulder pandemic response office. He teaches introduction to epidemiology for the public health certificate program, as well as introductory and advanced biostatistics for the Department of Integrative Physiology. Welcome, Matthew, and thank you so much for being here. I'm going to hand over the webinar controls to you now. Thanks, Laura. Appreciate the introduction, and, and thanks to everybody for, for joining and, and um, kind of tuning in to hear what is happening. Um, one year later with uh, the epidemiology of, of the pandemic. Um, so before we jump in, I, if you've seen me talk before, you've seen this, or if you've taken my class, you've seen this. Um, epidemiology, right, is, is we study the distribution and determinants of health-related phenomena in human populations and the applications of this to study to, to control health problems. And I like this quote from Jeremy Morris, um, which came out of 1957, epidemiology is the only way of asking some questions in medicine, one way of asking others, and importantly, is in no way at all to ask many. Um, and so epidemiology has a very important role in understanding uh, the, the, the pandemic of COVID-19, but obviously we are part of a collaborative team that uh, you know, can address the overall impact and how uh, we can find our way uh, out of uh, out of the mess that we're in. So before I jump in, I also want to sort of if, if people could keep this in mind. Um, I think it's is really important um, uh, to do you know our definition of health, um, especially during a pandemic. I think we lose sight of this. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease uh, or infirmity. And I think this is an important thing we need to consider as we start to navigate our way out of uh, this, this, uh, this horrible year that we've experienced. So the overview of the talk, I, I wanna take a quick look back. I also want to uh, look a little bit at what we've learned in this past year. I won't spend a lot of time on that because I think everybody you know, is well aware of what we're, what, what's been going on. I do wanna spend a little more time on what we're learning now both as it relates to vaccines and variants and, and sort of you know, aspects of how those two may be intertwined. Um, and uh, of course, we, a bit of discussion on how the pandemic will end. And the goal is of course, to leave some time for questions because this, you know, this, this is an area that, that fosters a healthy, uh, healthy discussion and questions. So first, if we take a look back, it's a very busy timeline, but I just want to, you know, this is just a snapshot of the three months, the first quarter of, of the calendar year of 2020. 
Um, and this is really, you know, so, some of these sort of milestones that we reached. Um, you know, really the first really documented known case that we had uh, in the world uh, was a man in his 70s who was experiencing some symptoms in Wuhan, China. Uh, that was December 1st. The, the man was later hospitalized. Um, you know, over the course of December into early January, uh, there was interactions between the World Health Organization and, and uh, government officials in China on what was happening there. About mid-January, the, the Wuhan Central Hospital uh, Respiratory Department filled up. Uh, and then shortly after that, the genetic sequence of what was afflicting these patients uh, was made public. Not long after that, the very first confirmed case of coronavirus, I say confirmed, we don't know, of course, if there was other circulating cases at this time or before, but the first confirmed case was January 21st. And we now know that the first known death uh, of COVID-19 occurred in San Jose, California, uh, February 6th. So obviously we are right at that one year window. And in fact, one year ago yesterday, um, the World Health, or World Health Organization named this disease COVID-19. Uh, so you can imagine that hashtag COVID-19 has since uh, you know, exploded in social media circles and so on as being the official disease associated with this uh, particular virus. Then, of course, moving forward, right, it was we're not even a year into this yet before uh, the WHO had uh, declared this uh, COVID-19 a, a global pandemic. And in, in about mid-March is when Europe became the epicenter uh, of the pandemic. And of course, the rest, you know, is, is quite literally history that we're still unfortunately living through. So when we go through, you know, kind of what we've learned, um, you know, epidemiologists tend to take a, a look through the lens of the epidemiologic triangle. We try to understand who's most vulnerable as host. Obviously, we need to understand what is the agent that's afflicting individuals and patients. The environment is critically important, especially for something like SARS-CoV-2. And time is always a feature here in terms of what we need to uh, consider uh, for, um, you know, how the disease is befalling the population. And so briefly on the agent, right, we know what this virus is, SARS-CoV-2. It's named SARS-CoV-2 because there was a SARS-CoV-1, which er uh, emerged in uh, also in China in early 2000s. Um, key features of SARS-CoV-2, right, it's got this corona, this crown-like structure, these spike proteins, um, and these spike proteins bind to our human uh, cells through the ACE2 receptor, which are again lined uh, in our nasal passages, uh, in our lungs, in our gastrointestinal tract. And part of the, the real you know, severity of this illness among individuals that develop pneumonia uh, is its ability to replicate in, in fairly uh, extreme amounts deep within our lungs. And that obviously creates that characteristic signature of, of the uh, um, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 pneumonia. Um, upon infection, right, the, you know, the body then responds through T cells and B cells. We'll come back to T cells because that's very important as we talk about both variants and also vaccines. But through the recruitment of other immune cells, we develop an antibody response that then recognizes uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus if we were to be in, uh, reinfected. One of the main the key features, right? I mean, it was not even a year ago, there was still discussion about whether this could be transmitted person to person. Of course, most respiratory viruses absolutely can. It's just a, a matter of the degree to how much it can, it can be transmitted person to person. We learned very quickly that this is something that is transmitted um, uh, really through the air, uh, through aerosolized droplets that contain the viral particles that we then inhale. This is obviously very concerning early on when we learned about this is this was the, you know, uh, really, really puts the parameters on how quickly and widely this can spread, especially in particular environments. <clears throat> now, progression of SARS-CoV-2 to the actual COVID-19 disease. One of the really difficult aspects of this we learned very early on was this cascading uh, differences between the number of people who are exposed, and we saw some variability here in terms of the number of people exposed, right, in a household that may have only been 20, 30% of a household who was exposed to, to SARS-CoV-2 would become infected, right? That's, that's still something that we don't fully understand. 
of those who are infected, we know that only about half, 40 to 50% of them will develop overt clinical disease and have symptoms, right? Among that, right, among individuals who develop clinical disease, of course, there's a certain number that unfortunately experience more severe illnesses and, uh, and, and ultimately have high mortality uh, or die from the disease, right? And so the, these cascading events, right, are really what lead us to, to um, have to focus on various aspects of control, right? Because we don't know everybody who's infected. People don't know that they're infected themselves. Among those with clinical disease, it's really unclear, given the prognostic factors that we have, who will, be, who will later, later develop severe disease and who will uh, end up on a mild course. Um, and so these are the factors that we're trying to understand, obviously, within the, within the context of the host. But a very difficult aspect to control, right, is the fact that we are not able to understand who's infected without testing, right? We only have uh, sort of the tip of the iceberg, if you will, with the clinical disease. Uh, one of the key papers that came out early on, which, again, uh, was very alarming, was that the transmissibility, um, how infectious you are, peaks right before, if you were going to become symptomatic, uh, about a day before you were, your symptoms emerged, right? So you can imagine this being a complete nightmare for control because we are not able to understand, right, who is walking around and not just infectious, but reaching their peak infectivity. Um, people later becoming symptomatic, and you can see here in this graph from at day zero and on, right, as you move forward from day zero, your infectivity will drop. Now, how does that relate to the host? Well, for predicting mortality, <clears throat> this was a study looking uh, at medical records. Odds ratio gives us a sense of the degree of risk. So the higher number here, the higher the risk this particular factor is on, uh, in this case, looking at mortality, but also thinking about hospitalization and severe disease. Age being, by, you know, by and large, the largest risk factor that we know. Uh, this is not every one year. This is actually coded more as a kind of categories of age, but we know, right, that a 25-year-old's course of illness is very different than a 75-year-old, and that's reflected in, the, in what they found. We also see a series of pre-existing conditions, history of pneumonia, in particular recent history, type 2 diabetes, different types of cardiovascular disease, uh, cerebral vascular disease, other types of things like, um, you know, um, lung cancer and so on, right? Anecdotally, through clinical reports, we knew this, but now we're really seeing this in, in a confirmatory way from our epidemiologic studies that there is really a unique profile of individuals who are at higher risk of severe outcomes from this disease. We're also starting to unpack what's going on in individuals' immune systems. And so this is really an exciting study that, that showed, you know, perhaps a reason why young children and, and adolescents are more protected from this is that there does seem to be a cross-reactive, uh, what they call seroprevalence, but cross-reactive uh, sort of immune response through antibodies and so on towards SARS-CoV-2. And that cross-reactivity is likely through other circulating coronaviruses. And so you can see here in this graph, these different age groups from zero to five, six to 10, 11 to 16, and so on. And when you get into the more advanced ages, right, very low pre-existing uh, uh, immunity to um, uh, this cross-reactive uh, immune factors for SARS-CoV-2. So again, this is stuff we're trying to understand to say, okay, is there something, you know, for therapeutics and so on you can think about that, that could make a, you know, 75-year-old have the immune system of a, of a 30, of a, you know, 15-year-old, for example. We're also really understanding how critically um, important T cells are in the immune system. Again, this is not a lecture on immunology. But we're finending out, this is a really wonderful study that looked longitudinally at different time points of the course of illness, starting at day zero from symptom onset. We see that individuals who, who had more of a mild course of disease had a very robust T cell response early in the course of the illness. T cells can be damaged through various things, immunosuppression, chemotherapy, and so on. As we age, obviously, there's factors that keep our immune system tuned up versus things that don't. Um, you know, again, age also is a function of, of kind of robust T cell uh, response as well. But this is starting to understand, unpack a little bit about who may be at risk, right, in terms of, of uh, severe illness uh, to, the, uh, to the infection. Okay, the environment. What we learned 
this was a really critical paper that came out, a study that came out fairly early into the pandemic. Uh, and this is, you know, in part, a lot of uh, really uh, uh, world-renowned aer aerosol scientists on the Boulder, Camp CU Boulder campus have contributed to this. But this was a restaurant in um, China um, where we learned very quickly how easily this is spread through the air. Um, and so there was an infected individual sitting at a table and the air conditioning flow, right, which did not pull in any external air. This was all internally recirculated, recirculated air, right? Individuals in this constellation of tables got infected, whereas individuals in the rest of the restaurant who had their own air conditioning uh, did not get infected. And so this was really one of the first keys that said, hey, you know, this is, this is something that can, that can hop on different air patterns. Uh, and, and really pointed the way towards uh, the need for, for better ventilation uh, to mitigate uh, the, the spread. There's also the tragic example uh, up at the state of Washington of a choir practice. 87% um, of the individuals got infected from one person. This was really more leaning us to think that, you know, um, you know loud talking and singing, right? Uh, produces, you know, kind of increased amount of aerosols that then can be spread uh, throughout the group. These were obviously people not wearing masks, um, and because it's fairly early on uh, in March, um, but we really saw how quickly this thing can take off given the right conditions. And then a large, very large study that was looking at kind of a meta-analysis across multiple outbreaks right, almost everything we've seen in terms of large clusters and large outbreaks that have been documented have come out of indoor settings, right? So this is another key piece of evidence that said, you know, that, that tells us kind of where, where, the, uh, where the environment's important here. Now the reproduction number, which is again, you know, I'm sure you've, you've all heard plenty of this by now, but again, this R0, this measure of intensity of the spread from an R0 of one, R0 of two, R0 of three, right? Any individual infecting two others, that individual infects two others and so on. Comparison to other diseases, um, you know, here's the Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome, influenza, kind of standard seasonal influenza, uh, Ebola. There's COVID-19, SARS, which is the, the SARS-1, is is, has a slightly more infectious profile than COVID-19. And then you get up to something like measles, which is remarkably uh, transmissible. So again, this is something that, you know, given uh, the fatality and the severity of the disease and many individuals who are infected with COVID-19, this, this is a concerning uh, reproductive number. But one of the features about SARS-CoV-2 that had really been perplexing and we now understand a lot more is the super spreading feature. And so it's estimated that about 80% of the cases arise from anywhere from 10 to 20% of primary cases. And so that makes it really difficult, right, to, to, you know, kind of study. It's not as if on average everybody is infecting two people, which would be more uh, in line with what we see with, for example, the seasonal flu, right? And so the CDC published this early in the pandemic where here was a range of different reproduction numbers that have been reported under different settings, right? That's a wildly variable, um, you know, uh, or not, if, if you will, for, for SARS-CoV-2, anywhere from as low as one to two, all the way up to 10. Um, one of the natural experiments that we have uh, was on the Diamond Princess cruise ship in February, uh, which really there was no masks, there was no real knowledge of what was going on, and the R0 or the reproductive number there was about two, two, two and a half to two, two point three to two and a half. Um, so again, this you know what the the point of this is that this reproduction number seems to be heavily driven by. Um, kind of the environment and the host that you're that you're uh, part of. So, there, for example, here at CU Boulder in the during September, uh, that we had a fall surge. We were able to trace a significant number of cases back to uh, a couple of large events off campus um, that did not follow the feature of an R naught of two. These were these were in some situations, you know, we had 14, 15 cases coming out of a of a single party. So what have we learned just to just to wrap this up right we know this is a highly contagious virus right we know that older age being male also is another one underlying medical conditions there's a differing immun immunological response to this that seems to be important that will be exciting to learn over the coming months um, we know about the environments right indoor crowded poorly ventilated spaces 
if people are talking loud in there, yelling, screaming, sing, you know, singing, right, that makes it even worse. And of course, time, right? So the longer you spend uh, in these types of environments with an infected individual, higher probability of exposure. And there's also this concept that, you know, uh, dosage matters. So, you know, the longer you are with an infectious person, the higher the dose, uh, the viral dose that you're receiving from that individual. Uh, so time is also uh, critical. So moving on to what we are learning now, and this is something that we've learned over and over and over again, um, and we're learning it again now. All models are wrong, some are useful. And I, you know, I wanna make a sort of point, I, I, when I presented this back in April um, in May of uh, 2020, right here was you know, kind of a, a planning scenario for COVID-19. And I like to go back to this because there were three scenarios uh, proposed. Um, and scenario one had us riding through more or less equally, um, you know, sort of intense peaks and valleys throughout, uh, you know, the, the waning of the pandemic. Um, scenario two had us uh, with a spring surge, a spring peak, and then a very large fall winter surge. And of course, uh, scenario three, which we'd all hope would be uh, the reality was we, we'd gone through our surge in, in spring of 2020, and we kind of uh, quietly, um, you know, uh, have lower and lower peaks throughout uh, the rest of the year. What are we seeing now? This is a snapshot from at least the United States, and this looks very familiar, uh, similar to other countries around the world. Um, it does look as though um, things are playing out as scenario two. Um, and again, United States, a little bit more complicated. We have a lot of geographic uh, and, and uh, temperature variation in this country. Um, so these kind of little, the triads of peaks are, are you know, likely the, the upper Midwest and Rocky Mountain region handing off to the coasts and then handing off to, to California, for example, LA County, which had a, a strong peak. Um, but the good news is, right, things are, are dropping very quickly and they're dropping, in, in fact, faster than they've ever, they've ever dropped uh, in, in this entire pandemic. As you can see, this, the slopes of these drops are, are much uh, lower compared to what we see with um, the drop now. So it does look as though um, the fall peak uh, is consistent, the scenario two with a large fall peak. That's what we saw with the 1918 uh, uh, influenza pandemic where there was a initial spring wave and then there was a very devastating fall uh, winter uh, wave that followed. Um, and so it does look as though that's, that's where we are. Um, one of the other challenges with this that we're learning, of course, is um, with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID, it's very difficult really to know the extent to which the population has had this or currently are infected. And why that is, right, we've got a substantial number of people who are asymptomatic. We've got a number of folks that, you know, depending upon the testing platform, there may be false negatives that keeps us undetected. And then we've got tests that, that would pick up true positives, right? And so if you're doing asymptomatic screening, uh, you would pick them up. Or if somebody was symptomatic and received testing, they would also be picked up as a true positive. Now, how's this playing out? Again, you know, this is a bit of a dramatic headline, but the why the pandemic is 10 times worse than you think uh, from the pandemic. Uh, modelers out of the uh, Columbia University uh, you know, here's this line here, and this is sort of kind of the, the relative confidence around the line, that shaded beige area around this, more of the orange line here, of what we actually thought were the number of infections that uh, the, the population sustained in the United States. Obviously, early on, right, we had a lot more uh, infections than we were detecting. We just didn't have testing going back then. Testing's been better, right? So we're picking up more confirmed cases, but there's still this large surge that we were on that literally under the surface of uh, the water that we're unable to detect. So current estimates, right? And again, it ranges wildly. They, they estimate that the Dakotas may be 50, 40, 50% of the state of North and South Dakota have been infected by now. Overall across the United States, the estimate is in this sort of 30 to 35% range um, of people who've been infected despite only 8% reported to, to having been infected through a diagnostic test. We also see that in uh, models from the state of Colorado. This is the, the state of Colorado modeling team. 
who's worked uh, through Anschutz and CU Boulder and, and Colorado State and other higher ed institutions on supporting the CDPHE's effort to understand uh, the, the trajectory of this pandemic in Colorado. And so you can see here again, right, the reported infections here are the darker brown, right, but the, this larger peak, this beige peak here is really what we, what, what the, the model had estimated was really happening uh, during our, in Colorado at least, our, our large surge in, um, in the fall and into, the, into winter. Uh, so again, you know, that's, so yes, the pandemic was probably a lot worse than we, uh, you know, were detecting. We knew that going in, but we're really starting to learn that that, that is probably, uh, you know, the case. So continuing on, um, what we're learning now, uh, there's a big effort now with the WHO and, uh, you know, governments from across the world to try to understand the origins of SARS-CoV-2. As you can imagine, um, given how sensitive and contentious just, it, uh, you know, sort of the, the initial identification of cases and so on, right? This is, this is a incredibly political um, requiring, you know, uh, issue that's going to require some, some fairly uh, talented diplomacy uh, to get through this. WHO has been granted access uh, to uh, areas of Wuhan and to start looking through uh, some of the origins. And so here's a sort of an announcement of that. And you may have seen it in the news. Um, they start the investigation. And again, you know, there, there's a lot of scenarios that are being uh, laid out there. Um, you know, one of the more common ones, I think that, that you know, has, has gained some traction. You know, this SARS-CoV-2 does share a lot of important, you know, kind of molecular characteristics with with uh, coronaviruses that are found in uh, particular horseshoe bats. Um, and, you know, again, it, it's probably not something that's super simple. It's probably not something that, a, that it may have jumped straight from a bat to a human. Um, obviously there's been a lot of discussion about the wet markets and, and so on and so forth. Um, there could be an intermediary uh, species that has been un unidentified at this point. And the key feature here, and we'll talk about this with variants, right, is that as they move through different species, the, the virus moves through different species, there's going to be evolutionary pressures um, that, that are, you know, placed upon the virus within those species, and, and then it can adapt and, and, and change to the point where it could then take a jump from, a, a, for example, another intermediate species to a human. Um, and again, this is, this is really some of the steps that they're going to try to, to, to detangle. Um, I just want to note that this is something that's going to take quite a while, right? This is not something that, you know, um, I think it took probably 20, 25 years uh, for us to really fully grasp where um, HIV um, had, had originated from. Um, and, you know, it can take years to find the origin of viruses that have made the zoonotic, zoonotic jump from animals to humans. And Dr. Sarah Sawyer is an expert of that. It's here at CU Boulder, and she's given a talk recently on that, I think maybe in the last week. Um, but, you know, as you might imagine, um, you know, watching this space, this is going to be probably one of the more contentious, you know, stressful, straining international relations, straining uh, <laughs> investigations that goes. Um, uh, scientists are already uh, pushing back on the initial report that seemed to rule out um, a uh, laboratory-derived um, origin. And again, when I say laboratory-derived, I'm not saying something that was engineered, but rather, you know, research that was conducted on coronaviruses, um, you know, whether or not it was, uh, you know, accidentally, uh, you know, out of the lab. While that's not likely, they want to explore that. There's been a hypothesis that was put out about cold food chain, uh, meat chain packaging, uh, which I don't think I've not heard any uh, sort of serious virologist or uh, epidemiologist really take that um, that particular origin hypothesis seriously. So there's a lot of politicking going on, diplomacy that the WHO is going to have to do here. Um, the State Department just announced here in the U.S. that they're not going to take the WHO at its word, and they're going to have to evaluate the evidence on their own. So you know you can imagine how this will unfold. Now, on to some of the, the good news, um, into vaccines. This is the Pfizer vaccine. I just wanna show, you know, this is, these are things that um, we just don't see that often. 
in biomedical research or, or therapy development. Um, this is, uh, you know, essentially a, what they call kind of a Kaplan-Meier curve or survival curve. Again, this, the, you know, what we're seeing here is the days after dose one of the Pfizer vaccine, individuals here, down here received the uh, active vaccine, individuals here uh, received a placebo. And really what you wanna see and what was seen here um, is a fairly dramatic, um, you know, uh, display of uh, the effectiveness of the active vaccine. And so the placebo group uh, accumulated infections at a certain rate, whereas the vaccinated group uh, uh, remained fairly um, protected. We saw the same exact pattern with the Moderna uh, vaccine. Both of them are these mRNA uh, vaccines. Um, but again, remarkable efficacy and protection from um, you know, COVID uh, following the doses of these two vaccines. One thing I wanted to, to emphasize with this is, is it, again, it's frustrating as the discussions in the public and, and within public health agencies and so on, uh, I, I feel have lost a little bit of the message um, and so if we think about vaccines in terms of both their efficacy and efficacy in particular to prevent infections versus the propensity of the vaccines to protect individuals from more severe consequences, uh, including severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And so we can think of a couple scenarios, right, where we may have a vaccine that was developed that does a pretty good job of protecting against disease. So you maybe really have shaved off and protected individuals from being hospitalized and, and more importantly, dying of the disease. Um, but we still have uh, infections that occur, right? So if you were an uh, individual who may have had a mild disease without the vaccine, you may become someone who's asymptomatic. If you were someone who would otherwise have had a moderate disease, it may be more of a mild course. Individuals who would have otherwise died, hospitalized, or had a very severe course may only have a moderate uh, course of disease, right? So that's one vaccine. And again, this is one that I think, you know, going back a year, right? One year later, we would have all clamored and, and, and really have uh, celebrated something like this, even if it's a therapeutic, if we all could have taken a, a pill that would have more or less guaranteed that would have kept us out of the hospital, I think we would have done it. Vaccine two right, is even better because not only does it protect against disease, right, but it also shows that it's a pretty pronounced efficacy on actual infections themselves. And so this is where we are. We're trying to think, of, we're, we're trying to do studies now uh, with uh, these different vaccines. Here's the list of all of them that's been improved in different parts of the world. Uh, both the Moderna, Pfizer, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will likely be approved, uh, I think it's next week. Um, and that those doses will be available in the US starting in March, um, which is a single dose vaccine. But if we look at some of the two dose vaccines here, right, all these individuals that received the vaccine, 15,000, 18,000, 22,000, you know, 8,500, 9,000, right? You know, remarkably, right, following the doses of vaccine that they received in these trials, right, to date, We've only been able to identify one person after the first dose of a Moderna trial that was hospitalized. And there's even questions about whether that individual needed to be hospitalized, right? So you're looking at something that is really, really protective, right, against severe consequences of this disease. Furthermore, right, even severe disease that may not have been hospitalized, also remarkable protection against really severe cases of the disease. The one that we're watching very closely, obviously, is how this works against different variants. And I've got a, some slides on that coming up, right? But again, right, you're talking about changing the dynamics, changing the face, defanging this virus and this disease to be much less severe through the use of vaccines. Now, what's frustrating, just to sort of, you know, circle back on this, this was an article that just came out this week. Uh, out of the San Jose Mercury News. And here was the, the headline, California man tests positive for COVID-19 weeks after getting the second vaccine dose. You dig into the way into the article, you see this quote here, as for Michael, who was the individual who was diagnosed, he said his living girlfriend tested positive for coronavirus five days after he received his second dose. 
and said his case was relatively minor. So this was an, in, a, an elderly individual with multiple underlying medical conditions who was going into the hospital for a routine procedure due to one of his underlying medical conditions. As part of hospital protocol, they tested him uh, for coronavirus. They d detected that he had it. He barely had any symptoms. And that really should be the story. Not that someone actually got infected, but the story should be, in my opinion, that this may have protected Michael from very worsening uh, course of illness that would have happened if he weren't vaccinated. And indeed, there are uh, areas that are running with the story. So just out of the Times of Israel yesterday, uh, the headline is it works. Zero deaths and only four severe cases among over 500,000 fully vaccinated Israelis. Um, and if you look at the curve that's happening in Israel, it's remarkable. These are new hospitalizations. And again, we know that in vaccinations among Israelis 60 and over, that vaccinations, right, which they started in late December, early January, right, really started to have its impact. Uh, and now, right, there are more zero to 59 year old age uh, Israelis who are being hospitalized than individuals over 60. So in Israel, who's probably three, four weeks ahead of the rest of the world, real time, real world evidence that, you know, this can change the shape and the dynamic of, of this pandemic. So overview on vaccines, remarkably protective against severe outcomes, including hospitalizations and deaths. It seems to have strong efficacy against infection. Caveat there is that we'll talk about the variants. Early evidence suggests that among those who are infected after being vaccinated have a milder course and a lower viral load. If you have a lower viral load, there's also reason to believe that you'll be less infectious uh, to spread it to others. Efficacy in terms of protection from uh, uh, efficacy against infection, likely to extend years. We don't know that yet because again, we're, we're just one year into this, but given the early indications um, that, you know, and what we know about coronaviruses and, and, and so on and so forth, but protection against severe disease may actually last a lot longer. And again, we'll, we're gonna come back to this with, with variants. Currently the vaccines, right, studied uh, both phase one, phase two and phase three. Uh, are remarkably safe relative uh, uh, for the populations that have been studied. And I'm sure you've heard, but they're now studying these in children, uh, you know, more targeted studies among women who uh, are, want to become pregnant, who are pregnant, um, different individuals with, with immunostatus that may be different. Um, there was some work on HIV status in South Africa for this, but those are, those are studies that are, that are ongoing. Now, the variants, right? This has been on everyone's mind as well. Um, and this is from the CDC. There's three primary variants that we're watching closely. This is this B117 and the B1351. Um, and again, this is one that was first identified in the United Kingdom. Uh, the B1351 uh, was first identified in South Africa. There's also this P1 that was uh, first identified in Japan and Brazil. Now, what are these variants, right? These are mutations, right, from the original introduction of the virus into the human population. Um, and again, people have said, well, what does this mean? How is this gonna impact us and so on? The first thing to note is that this type of, uh, uh, you know, of process of mutations and, and evolution, right, is gonna be expected, right? The longer it has time uh, within the, a new host uh, reservoir, such as humans, right? It's going to find uh, just by you know evolutionary chance, right? The more transmissible uh, state to be able to optimize its spread through the population, right? So if a virus, for example, to become really really nasty and all of a sudden kill 80, 90 percent of its hosts, right? That would would burn out pretty quickly. Versus a virus that becomes less and less severe right, but everyone's walking around sneezing and coughing on each other and it spreads readily, obviously that, that optimizes its, its uh, projection into, into the population. So the important thing to note is that this was, this was expected, you know, should we be worried, right, there's a lot of headlines on this, there's alarming variants, right, you know, we have to do this, we have to do that, I, you know, uh, people saying this is sort of a wake-up call, um, and I don't disagree, I think that, you know, this is a real, 
um, you know, issue for the for the for the global community to to ramp up genomic surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 to to track what mutations are arising, what variants are arising, and what impact those may have both on vaccines, but also on the transmissibility. The one thing that's important to note is that these mutations um, that we're seeing, these variants, right? This doesn't you know, turn them into some sort of super survivable virus that can last longer in the air and travel further distances and so on. The variants seem to be um, altering that, um, you know, the, the spike protein on the, the uh, outer coat of the virus that enables it to bind more effectively with higher affinity to the ACE2 receptors. And so it may also be involved with a slightly higher viral load, things like that. But again, a higher viral load would mean somebody's more infectious, and so that would again be a, an advantage for the virus to, uh, you know, to have those mutations. And again, um, you know, the point that you know I like to make, right? The same preventative measures apply, right? Masks will prevent the original SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, just as effectively as they they will prevent these new uh, particles or these new variants. Excuse me. Um, there's growing evidence that vaccines, right, prevent severe cases, hospitalizations, and death from all the known variants, right? These are early papers that are coming out, um, but the, the papers that I've seen are very promising, again, for that protection. Now, the efficacy question, right, we need to keep addressing. Will it prevent infections at the same rate as the vaccines for the original infections, Right? Or is it more of a protection on these um, uh, se severe outcomes? And again, that's where the T cells come in again, um, where the T cell, um, the, 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 um, the T cell and B cell immunity that is developed through vaccines, right, is what is, is what we're really focused on that really prevents those severe outcomes, uh, such as hospitalization and death, right? Is it less so about the neutralizing antibody ability of the vaccines? So again, this is going to be tracked. Could we need a booster in the future? Absolutely. Will we need to take these same vaccine boosters in two or three years? Possibly, absolutely possibly, right? But right now, right, take the vaccine that becomes available to you because it will protect you against the severe outcomes of these of all of these variants, right? Whether you are less infectious or not, we, we still have to, to unpack that and study that going forward. And we wait, right? So there's been projections that the new variant that's been detected in the UK is going to ramp up a large surge in the US, uh, in a large spring surge in the US. Um, there's models that say we've seen the worst of this pandemic. There's models that say, you know, um, there's going to be a big surge coming because of these new variants. Obviously, vaccines and, and baseline immunity within the population are going to be factors that we have to consider. But again, by the end of next month, we should know whether or not these new variants are going are to fuel a third and potentially fourth wave uh, in the US. I wanted to say quickly about long COVID. This is something that's being uh, looked at uh, very closely. Uh, this is an interesting uh, sort of diary of a doctor who was working in the Russian flu pandemic, which actually may have not have been the flu after all. It may have been actually a coronavirus uh, pandemic of 1889. It was called the Russian flu. Um, but the discussion uh, that's been noted over pandemics is this um, sort of long COVID or long-term consequences of uh, the infection. And so again, uh, this is just getting going, published in December here, uh, really trying to unpack as we get further along and, and people have had COVID longer and longer in the past, what levels of long COVID, what are the symptoms, what are the treatment modalities that we can adopt uh, to support individuals that are suffering from, uh, from some of these longer term uh, impacts of COVID. Now, how will this end? Unfortunately, um, this discussion gets very political. Um, unfortunately, it's never not been political. Uh, if you look back at the 1918 flu, uh, we had all the same things. We had anti-maskers, we had you know, um, you know, discussions about what can be open, what can't be open, public health campaigns to wear a mask. Um, I think this stuff can get really ugly. This is one of the more distasteful headlines I've seen throughout the pandemic. This came out during the surge in LA County, uh, where they reported children apologizing to their dying elders for spreading COVID. 
Um, and this is a quote from the article. Officials believe the current spike was driven in part by family gatherings around Thanksgiving and Christmas that allowed younger people who are more likely to be out and about to spread COVID-19 to their elders. So this is not good public health. This is bad. We know this is bad. Um, to, to beat up children for, uh, you know, what would become a very devastating experience for them uh, is not going to help anyone. And this is where I feel the exhaustion, the tiredness with the pandemic is, is really unraveling, especially within public health officials, to blame individuals uh, for, for things like this when there is obviously the adults in the room failed to contain this from, from the early stage. Very quickly, can we eliminate COVID? So we can control diseases, we can eliminate the actual disease, right? The severe hospitalizations and, and complications, we can eliminate infections. We can also eradicate things, right? And then we can have things that are actually extinct. Now, this argument out there that we need to have a zero COVID world, I just wanna sort of make sure we all understand what that might mean, right? Do we have an effective intervention to interrupt transmission? Interrupt transmission, yes. Do we have the diagnostic tools to, to test it? Of course we do. Um, here's the thing. Are humans essential for the life cycle? Meaning, are there any other reservoirs that this, could, 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 uh, this virus could be part of? And we know, right, there are multiple animal reservoirs that SARS-CoV-2 can, uh, can survive. In. The only known, the only disease that we've eradicated in humans is smallpox. There's others that we're hoping to eliminate. We have, an ex we have, it's not extinct yet because smallpox still lives in two labs in the world. Um, but again, we have to be very, very honest with ourselves about the ability for us to eradicate COVID from, uh, from the earth. So what does it look like in the short term? Well, here's some projections on herd immunity. And so we go over time here, right? From starting in January of this year, the purple here are people who've had COVID the blue are people who are getting vaccinated. Now, again, the projections are when we start in the United States, when we start getting past May and into June of this year, right, we're going to look at a very different phase of this pandemic. It's going to be a lot less concerning because our hospitals are going to be emptied out and our deaths are going to be plummeting because, in this case, over 60% of the population, largely adults who are at higher risk than children, right, will have uh, protection from severe forms of the disease, no matter what variant circulated, all right? And as we move forward, right, it may be a grind to get up to quote unquote herd immunity and snuff this thing out, but the important thing that the protection is gonna be there. So how will it end? They say pandemics do not end with a bang, they end with a whimper, right? And so you're gonna have people that, that are gonna be out there that are gonna say it's never gonna end, right? That there's never gonna be a normal. Um, and to an extent, Right, there may not be there not be the normal that we had, you know, going back to you know uh, January of, of 2020. Right, the new normal may be we we obviously will never scrub COVID-19 from our from our mental state, um, but the new normal may be that we accept that not living with it is a bad thing, but that we live with it, knowing that it's with the protections of vaccines and other uh, sort of natural immunity that this is not going to be something that's going to to put us in the hospital and uh, into the morgue. And sociologists and demographers, if if this is helpful at all, they're predicting as as pandemics end, uh, incomes, uh, you know, a roaring uh, sort of I guess YOLO phase of of uh, the pandemic where um, we can maybe look forward to uh, many parties and uh, the next set of roaring twenties. Again, back to health, right? We, we need to be thinking about this as we move through uh, the end of the pandemic, right? Thinking about mental, physical uh, health beyond COVID because there's a lot of people suffering from other things that, that, that are gonna need some, some attention very soon. And with that, I will wrap it up. Um, thank you. And we will take, Laura will take questions uh, if anybody has questions. Thank you, Matt. Um, a reminder, if you have any questions during this time, please submit them through the Q&A interface. And also we will be sending out a, a link to the recording tomorrow. Our first question comes from William. It is my understanding that the seasonal flu we see today came from the 1918 Spanish flu outbreak. 
Do you see SARS COVID two replacing the seasonal flu going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. And one thing we didn't uh, discuss today was that um, there has been no <laughs> detectable seasonal flu uh, in the Northern hemisphere uh, since SARS CoV-2 has, has uh, bullied its way in. Whether that's some kind of weird competition, you know, they're both transmitted in roughly the same way. Whether masks and distancing uh, are more effective against the flu, uh, that's stuff that'll still be studied. Um, but it's a, it's a, you know, uh, it's a great point. Uh, the current circulating coronaviruses, there are four to five that are predominant um, that uh, seem to be living in harmony in terms of circulation with uh, the seasonal flu. Uh, but I don't think we've ever seen anything quite so dramatic of, of a, we saw it with H1N1, but that was again, a kind of a flu strain bumping out other flu strains. I don't think we've seen a different type of virus, a coronavirus bump out something like uh, uh, an influenza virus before to this degree. There was no flu in the Southern hemisphere during their winter. We do not see any flu here in the Northern hemisphere. Um, and so it's, it's really anybody's guess as to how, how this will play out coming in the next, uh, next year or two. Thank you, Matt. Our next question comes from Bob. Can you get the coronavirus if you had a mild case already? Yeah, another good question. Um, so, and again, you know, with immunity, um, the thought is that if you've had a mild case, if you were to be infected again, and again, the, the immunity seems to be fairly robust six to eight months out, and we keep kind of moving that clock forward because, um, you know, we, we are, we're now living with it longer and longer. Um, immunity, for the examples that I've seen, people who have been previously infected will uh, have a, a sort of less and less severe course of the infection uh, if they were reinfected uh, going forward. Um, it's technically possible we're seeing reinfections uh, out there. Some have argued whether it's really a reinfection or just kind of a chronic uh, infection. But uh, by and large, I think that, you know, we, we, we should all, whether we're vaccinated or through natural infection, uh, could get infected again. And I think the, with T cell and B cell involvement, the severity of the infection would get, I think, less and less over time. Thank you, Matt. Our next question comes from Paul. Do we know why the fall peak is dropping so quickly? Yeah, another good one. I, I, I really, this is where we're in a really unpredictable in terms of forecasting and prediction with models. We're in a really unpredictable phase. Um, we, we don't fully understand why the pandemic is retreating so quickly. Uh, the, the slope of the, of the drop across the United States is, is something that I don't think any models necessarily predicted. Um, it, some have argued that there's a, a strong seasonal component that we haven't quite captured, um, that maybe just it's less able to, to spread. Some have said that uh, there could be early, early indications of herd immunity kicking in. It's a little bit too early for vaccines. Um, so that's another open question that I think we will, you know, over the next few months, especially if, the, if the, these new variants do not drive a new infection. And just to be clear, models in January said we'd have a rising number of infections now based upon the new variants. So we're already pushing that out. Um, but again, th this is another really good question that, that's going to be unfolding. The answer will be unfolding over the next couple of, of months. Thank you, Matt. Our next question comes from Martin. What do you think is driving the increasing percentage of different variants? Um, so the increase, I, so I think my, 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 my sense is that the variants, it's, it, the, the virus has been mutating as it always mutates um, you know, throughout the entire pandemic. Um, obviously the more transmissions and the, and the more fuel it has to, to pass through from person to person, the more opportunity it has to, to mutate and, and spread in a different way. Um, and so I think we're just finally starting to look a little closer as we should have been doing. Um, at the same time as coming after, you know, in the Northern hemisphere, a monster surge, right? You know, something like, you know, 50% of all the cases have happened in, across the world within the last, in the Northern hemisphere within the last, you know, couple of months. So I think coupled with, you know, this constantly mutating plus more opportunity uh, with this massive surge, that has likely, you know, and, and us looking for it more closely, 
that has led to this proliferation, I think, of the of the variants that we're now uh, seeing, and we'll see probably going into the future. Thank you, Matt. Our next question comes from Alan. Um, any comments about situations where people have been documented having persistent active infections, not merely the symptoms? Yeah, and that's uh, um, so the persistent the persistent infections. Um, there have been a handful of cases that I've, I've, I've read about and seen on that um, where, you know, two, three months into the infection, the individual uh, is just simply not able to clear the infection, even though they're, they're not really experiencing a, a terribly severe course of illness. As a matter of fact, there's some that speculate that, that um, you know, mutations sort of variants can thrive in that particular environment because they have a long period to, uh, you know, for, for, for mutations to take hold. Um, but again, uh, it's probably due to some B cell, C, T cell, B cell function that is just not able to finally clear the virus um, out of the out of the host. Um, you know, they, they've got a fairly decent antibody response, but um, they're just not able to their immune system is just not able to clear it. Um, and those are those are individuals that they're watching closely. There doesn't seem to be that common, but it but it has happened for sure. Thank you, Matt. Our next question comes from Dean. Early in the pandemic, there was some indication that susceptibility to COVID-19 could be tied to blood type. Has this been resolved? Yeah, another good question. That, you know, the, the initial indications of that, I think um, from, from early, this is very early data. I have not seen it published yet. I've talked to some individuals that, that are doing this work. There does seem to be a slightly uh, elevated increased risk for the individuals with um, type A. Um, however, it's not quite to the extent that they they saw or initially saw in early in the pandemic. Um, again, they don't fully understand why that is, but they're now looking across multiple areas across the world to see if it's really, uh, you know, related to blood type um, and whether it's there's little pockets that it that it sort of found its way through and, and there could be more vulnerability. Um, but again, with blood types, there are different, obviously, immune status. So it's, it's certainly something that, uh, that I think will end up being a risk factor, but it may not be to the extent that they initially had con were concerned about back in April and March. Thank you, Matt. We're moving into our final two questions. Um, our first one calls, comes from Mariana. What are the vaccine study trial plans for children and teens? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, they, they've now fully enrolled. Um, I think both Pfizer and Moderna have fully enrolled. Um, uh, I think children, I think it's 12. They, they, the way they do this is they'll, they'll roll it back. Um, they won't just jump all the way back to example for, you know, for five-year-olds. They roll it back in, you know, four and five age, uh, age bands. So they'll roll it back, for example, to, uh, you know, 12-year-old and up, for example, is where they are now. Um, and assuming as they as they roll, roll through that the safety profile stays more or less the same, they will continue to creep back on on the ages. Um, and so uh, I think we'll have answers actually before the summer on the safety and efficacy and protection of uh, the vaccines among primarily you know 13, teenagers. And then I think that'll over the summer they'll roll back into younger populations. Um, and, you know, with, with the same type of approach. So it doesn't require starting all over and waiting a year. You can actually, um, you know, just sort of expand the window of, of your population that you've studied to include a new age group. And that's what they'll do for other types of conditions and in individuals, for example, type 1 diabetes or whatever it may be, uh, to understand the profile in, in, in specific populations. Thank you, Matt. Our final question comes from Peter. What is the role of pathology in transmission and contracting the disease? Do we know anything about pathology for COVID? That is another one. Um, again, assuming the questions about just sort of general, um, you know, pathological features of COVID, you know, the early, you know, the, again, uh, you know, severe acute respiratory syndrome, that was the initial tag that was put on this, which is the name of SARS-CoV-2. Um, but we are now learning more and more uh, that this is not just a disease, uh, you know, of the lungs. Um, there seems to be 
you know, uh, a potent uh, kind of generalized inflammatory uh, state that obviously will impact the cardiovascular system. Uh, I think there was just a paper that came out this week on the cardiovascular and cardiac readings of, um, you know, of, of individuals who, who've been afflicted with COVID. Um, and so, yeah, the, you know, whenever we have a brand new disease, which we, this is a brand new disease, um, you know, the, you know, kind of different criteria that are used to diagnose and, and determine through pathology what this disease characteristic is. Is it specific to SARS-CoV-2? Is it more general to viral infections? Right. This is a lot of the stuff that we have to unpack uh, with uh, the pathology uh, community, as well as different clinical uh, experts on uh, the impacts. But it's broad, right? I mean, it is it is a multi-system uh, insult to the to the body, and um, it's going to take a while to really to characterize. You know, you've heard COVID toes, you've heard about rashes. Um, uh, there's there's you know lots of new ones that that have been popping up that um, we never could have predicted before uh, this hit. Thank you, Matt. Thanks so much for to everyone for joining us for today's presentation. And again, a big thank you to Matt for this great information. At this time, we invite you to provide your feedback on the webinar by answering the following poll question. On a scale from one to 10, how likely are you to recommend this webinar to a friend or other CU Boulder alumni? We thank you in advance for submitting your feedback. As a reminder, all webinar attendees will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this presentation as well as a survey. To view upcoming webinars as well as previous recordings, please visit our website at www.colorado.edu backslash business backslash alumni. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is February 17th as Jane Miller presents on managing a high growth, better for you snack company during COVID. In the meantime, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for your time and go Buffs.